Welcome to our third and final webinar in the Kitsap Salmon webinar series. All right, so our first speaker this morning will be Steve Todd. He is a salmon recovery biologist with the Suquamish tribe. Morning, everyone. It's good to be here. Hopefully you should see some slides. Great. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, wish I could be there in person, like we've all been going through this, but um, <clears throat> I'm Steve Todd, uh, salmon recovery biologist with the Suquamish tribe. And I've been uh, with the Suquamish tribe for a little over 10 years. And, and then before that, I was at the Point No Point Treaty Council for, um, for a little over 10 years. Um, so I've been working on um, salmon habitat and salmon uh, kind of focused um, projects for the tribes for a little over 20 years. Um, and so this morning, I'm going to um, talk about watersheds, probably reverse the title a bit, watershed salmon and climate change. Um, either way, what climate change might mean for our watersheds and the implications for uh, salmon and native trout in our streams. And um, I think I'll begin by just giving a little background on uh, treaty fishing rights. Um, many of you may be um, quite aware of this history already, but a little context. Um, the Suquamish tribe was party to the Treaty of Point Elliot, signed in 1880, 1855, which established the right taking fish at us usual and accustomed uh, grounds and stations uh, in common with all citizens of the territory. And the treaty was upheld uh, with the Bolt decision in the mid 1970s that reaffirmed um, these reserve fishing rights for the tribes of Washington State um, under those treaties. Uh, there were a number of other treaties as well. Um, the Treaty of Point No Point, uh, Treaty of Medicine Creek, uh, treaties all across the state of Washington. At that time, it was a territory. Um, importantly, the Bolt decision also allocated 50% of the annual harvest of fish to the treaty tribes. And uh, very importantly, um, it established the tribes and Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife as co-managers of the fisheries resource. And that's really important. I think there's a perception out there that um, goes back maybe many decades that the tribes and state fish and wildlife are, are always at odds and, and um, arguing about things. There still are disputes. However, there is a common, um, there are common goals toward um, protection of, of salmon populations and recovery of salmon, um, of salmon populations. I just want to emphasize that. So climate change can, um, can play out in, in different ways, depending on where you are in the world. Um, it's taking place at different rates, depending on where you are, and even at different scales. Some examples in polar regions, um, things are happening at a much more accelerated pace than in more temperate or equatorial areas. High elevation areas, like in alpine areas, changes are also occurring, uh, tend to occur more rapidly than closer to sea level. Um, where we are here, right at the sort of interface with the, the vast Pacific Ocean, um, the Pacific Ocean tends to um, moderate or, or temper, um, particularly air temperature increases. And so we're maybe fortunate to have the Pacific close by that really drives our, uh, so much of our weather patterns doesn't mean that climate change will not happen here, but it may occur a little more delayed than um, in some interior um, parts um, on uh, continental areas. Um, and the last thing is that I want to mention on this is that some ecosystems and species may uh, be uh, negative, negatively impacted. Their distributions may be um, co contracted um, and some species will likely disappear due to climate change, whereas other species may actually expand and benefit. Um, so uh, 
kind of what it maybe come down to is which species are they that uh, benefit and which um, will be harmed um, or uh, stressed by, by future climate change. Some key drivers of, of change, um, and this comes out of a, um, a report that the University of Washington put out a few years ago uh, that focused on climate change in the Puget Sound region that I'll be, um, I'll be drawing on a number of, uh, showing you a number of graphs from that work that they did that is relevant to the Puget Sound region. I'm also gonna draw on some more specific studies done right here in the Kitsap area. Um, in particular, Point No Point Treaty Council has just come out with some uh, recent uh, climate modeling work that look, is projecting stream flows and stream temperatures in the future under climate change scenarios. So I'm gonna really focus on temperature changes, mainly air temperature changes and how that might affect stream temperatures changes in precipitation patterns, in particular, um, heavy rainfall, um, increased heavy rainfall. I'm not gonna talk about sea level um, rise, ocean acidification, or really any changes in the marine environment. Um, those are huge, whole other uh, uh, topics there that are, are fascinating and, and very important to think about. I'm just not gonna touch on them here. And the other thing I, I'm not going to really go into is natural variability that is um, sort of beyond human greenhouse gas emission related um, variability in, in the climate. So this is a graph from that uh, Puget Sound um, regional work that the University of Washington developed a few years ago, just showing um, air temperature change uh, during the period of about 1950 to 2000. So sort of the historic or, or current period. And you see a, a slight change over that. You see a slight change in average um, air temperature, you know, that amounts to about 1.3 degree Fahrenheit since 1895 during that period. Precipitation change is, is a lot more variable and uh, really difficult to detect a, a distinct trend in that up until um, around 2000. <clears throat> now, when we project into the century that we're in now, the 21st century, um, what we see um, what, we, what we're showing here is again, air temperature difference from this baseline of, of let's call it zero. It's not really zero degrees Fahrenheit, but it's the baseline. So this is graph is showing um, the change in temperature as we project out into the future under a, um, a low, or I would actually say more moderate emissions scenario, greenhouse gas emission scenario, where there is some mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions as we go into the future. And then this more extreme, really unmitigated emissions scenario. And you could see that depending on that scenario, the air temperature is projected to rise um, on the order of uh, five or six degrees to above 10 degrees Fahrenheit um, by the end of the century we're in now. Again, precipitation into the future a lot more subtle, um, not quite as distinctive, but a slight increase in um, precipitation into the future, um, maybe on the order of around 10%. Again, um, a fair amount of, of variability. Um, and I think what I'll try to impress on, on you all through the presentation is that it's not so much um, how much precipitation falls over the course of an entire year, but how uh, that precipitation pattern changes by season um, and how that affects our uh, streams. So one thing that has been um, projected more recent uh, data here again from, I think it's mainly uh, again, folks from the University of Washington um, is that we are projected 
with, with the heaviest rainfall events that we get, they're associated, tend to be associated with these atmospheric rivers, um, the, you know, infamous Pineapple Express, that those types of events are projected to become uh, about 22% more intense um, by toward the end of this century. There's of course a big range there in the models. Um, typically these models are ensembles of many different uh, models. They don't just rely on one. So the, our current state of the knowledge is fairly clear. We're likely to see increases in air temperature. Um, less certain in the models and, and a little less clear, but there are indications of, um, of summer droughts, more summer droughts. We already have kind of a natural summer drought, but maybe even more intensive in the future. And then um, heavier rainfall and, and, and flooding associated with that in the winter time. And again, I wanna mention, uh, the only thing I will say about natural variation in, in, in uh, climate patterns is that natural variation at times can amplify these um, greenhouse gas or human related um, climate drivers. And at other times it might mask um, that. So in this case, we're going into um, a La Nina uh, winter that is typically, you know, a little colder and wetter. Um, and that type of uh, natural pattern in your climate may mask a longer term, say decadal long um, increase in, in air temperatures um, over time. So this graphic is, is really important. Um, and I want to, what I'm going to talk about now is how um, really an increase in air temperature is going to, is going to change the, the hydrology or the stream flows in different watersheds, depending on um, what type of watershed that is. And um, I'm going to go right to left rather than our sort of conventional left to right here, but um, this is illustrating these are high elevation um, watersheds that have a lot of snowpack or glacial um, reservoir of, of water. And the projection for the future is that winter flows um, are going to increase of quite dramatically, um, kind of in stepwise here by the 2040s and then by the 2080s. Um, and the reverse is projected to happen in the summertime um, where their summer low flows down here in, in July, August, September are projected to be quite a bit lower than what we see there now. Um, there's another kind of watershed that has kind of a mix of, of snowpack and glaciers, but also a lot of lower elevation area that doesn't um, tend to, where it doesn't tend to snow very much. We call these mixed rain snow uh, watersheds. And you also see that tendency projection for higher winter flows, lower summer flows. And the key thing is you see um, the whole pattern of stream flow is gonna change as we move into the future. Um, and finally, the types of watersheds we have here in the Kitsap Peninsula that are low elevation, we don't have snowpack, um, you'll see a more moderate um, increase in winter flows and a more moderate decrease in summer flows. And um, these are based on, on modeled projections. Um, and I, the, the main point here is that these hydrologic or, or stream flow changes are gonna be driven primarily by an increase in air temperature into the future. And so less of that rainfall, less of that precipitation, even at these middle and high elevations is gonna fall as snow, more of it's gonna fall as rain. So it's not gonna be um, trapped up in the, these higher mountain areas um, and instead is gonna run off more rapidly. So by the end, toward the end of the, um, even mid this century or the end of this century, these mixed rain snow systems, a lot of which we find like in the Olympic mountains are gonna start behaving more and more like these low elevation 
uh, rain dominant systems. And this is just a geographical um, showing of that same pattern where uh, this is on the far left kind of the situation today. The only real snow dominant systems that we see today are in the North Cascades. We see a lot of these still mountainous systems that are kind of uh, mixed rain and snow and um, a lot of low elevation rain dominated systems. As we progress through time um, toward the end of the century, we don't have any more snow dominated systems and most of the Puget Sound region as a whole tends to be rain dominant. So this is major implications on, on really how these um, these watersheds will behave in terms of stream flows and what that means for um, fish like salmon and native trout that are um, evolved, have evolved to um, those flow conditions. Again, these are all driven by, uh, really primarily driven by changes in air temperature, an increase in air temperature over time. So when we zoom in to our Look closer to home. This is uh, some recent, very recent work done by the Point No Point Treaty Council modeling stream flow and uh, stream temperature changes into the future. If you focus on, there's a lot of information in these graphs, but if you focus on these far left panels, the two extreme seasons of summer and down here winter, we are projected to see, and this is under a more moderate emission scenario. Um, we're expected to see upwards of, uh, in some cases with these mountainous systems, uh, looks like uh, 40 to 60% reduction in summer stream flows in, in, in summertime. In these low elevation Kitsap um, watersheds that don't have any snowpack, they're, these changes are more moderate. And they're projected in summertime to be more in the order of maybe 20 to 40% lower flows or even um, less than 20% of a change. Uh, contrast that with wintertime projections in these same watersheds and you see um, increases, in, in, in other words, more uh, flood flows, increases in flows upwards of um, 20, 40% during the winter time. Um, more muted changes with these low elevation um, rain dominated systems like we have here in Kitsap. So maybe on the order of, of upwards of 20% uh, uh, more flood flows or increased in um, increased flows during winter. This is the same type of information just showed shown in uh, table form. And I'm just highlighting, if you look at the percentage increases in flows here in winter, percentage decreases in flows in summer. And with the blue arrows, I'm just indicating these are the watersheds that are that are really tip, typical of the Kitsap Peninsula. So you see some familiar ones here, Big Beef Creek, Seabeck uh, Creek, Stavis Creek. Um, again, not as extreme in terms of the winter flow increases, nor as extreme in the summer um, flow decreases. Um, keep in mind, however, you guys probably know when you get out on our little creeks in the middle of summer, there's not a lot of stream flow there. And so um, our streams tend to already be quite vulnerable to um, any further reductions in, in flows. This is just showing the relationship between air temperature and stream temperature. This is the Big Quilcene River uh, flowing into Hood Canal, of course. So a more semi-mountainous terrain. Um, clear, clearly, as air temperatures begin to rise as the season progresses, the stream temperatures mirror that, but not to the uh, same extreme. So there are other factors going on besides air temperature um, in controlling uh, how warm our streams get. I also want to point out, and this graph shows it really nicely, um, again, from the Point No Point Treaty Council work, um, how the highest stream temperatures tend to coincide with 
uh, some of our lowest stream flows. And again, bear in mind what that mean, what could that mean for salmon? So I think this is a poll question and I've already given you some clues, but um, just give this group some things to think about. What are the factors that can impact water temperatures in Kitsap streams? All right, Steve, can you see the results? I can. I'm really surprised that more people didn't answer the espresso stands. I will say there might be, if you did a study of, of density of espresso stands in a watershed, there could be a, a strong relationship with, um, with, with water temperatures. And I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of joking, but actually, um, the more we develop a watershed, um, the more hardened surfaces and the, the more we remove native vegetation from our watersheds, uh, there is, there's a fair amount of research out there that um, shows that that tends to, um, that can warm waters during summertime. Um, so that's not that far-fetched. I didn't really mean that to be um, a correct answer, but Maybe that's what two of you out there had in mind. So good for you. Um, there are a number of factors that that can play into uh, uh, that can drive water temperatures in in our streams here in Kitsap. Um, the probably number one that I've already talked about and and a number of people answered correctly is air temperature down here, and uh, as it's a positive. Um, relationship as air temperature goes up, the water temperature tends to go up. And uh, I won't go into that too much. That is pretty intuitive for, for most folks. Um, riparian canopy, riparian meaning uh, the vegetation along streams and, and wetlands um, tends to, uh, the, the healthier, the more mature that vegetation tends to be just by virtue of shading the water um, but also providing inputs of large woody debris and um, promoting habitat complexity uh, tends to drive air temperatures down. Um, groundwater inputs, I think was another possible answer. Um, groundwater is, is cooler than most surface water in summertime, definitely. Um, and so the more that we have groundwater surface water um, connectivity and contributing to our streams. And we know that groundwater is, um, is hugely important to our streams. That those groundwater inputs also tend to drive temperatures down. There are a number of other things here too. Um, stream flow, uh, as flows get um, lower, temperatures can go up. And that is uh, tends to be more of a volume um, a function of volume of water and how a lower, uh, smaller volume of water can heat up more quickly. Um, so that can become a, a sort of a dual stressor for um, fish in summer times as high water temperatures and low flows. Um, a number of other factors in here that I've listed can also be important, like um, lakes or reservoirs that store water and can heat up more quickly um, can tend to drive temperatures up a um, steeper stream gradient, so more mountainous systems um, can tend to um, drive temperatures down. And um, some other factors too that uh, play into it. This is, is not necessarily an exhaustive list. Um, I circled these three and we'll come back to these because I feel like we as humans have um, some control over these factors. They're not um, sort of inherent uh, to a certain watershed. You can't really affect how high elevation a watershed is. You can't even really affect how much uh, rainfall is gonna fall in your watershed, um, nor can you really affect what the air temperature, the ambient air temperature is gonna be. But you can moderate these things by making sure that your groundwater inputs are protected you protect your riparian areas and um, you know you don't extract too much um, water from groundwater or from surface water and um, you do other things in your watershed to protect the, the natural flow regime. I'm gonna have to keep moving on here, um, <laughs> but 
Now we get into you know what what these changes to stream flows mean for salmon, and um, there are recommended temperature criteria out there for salmon and trout, um, like steelhead, cutthroat trout, that are based on years of, of uh, studying fish, uh, both fish in tanks, but also fish in their natural environment to see how well they grow, when do they become stressed, when do they outright die. And a couple of things here to bear in mind is, uh, particularly for rearing in freshwaters, there's this um, what we call 16 degrees Celsius threshold. And it's a little more complicated than just going out and taking the temperature at one point in time. The way Washington State water quality standards looks at this is through this seven day moving window of um, average daily maximum temperatures. So if I go out tomorrow and it's the highest temperature I record during the course of the day is 18 degrees, the following day it's uh, 16 degrees and the following after that. I do that for seven days and I average all of those together. It's a little complicated to think about, but it's a more, what we've decided is it's probably a more biologically realistic way that the fish are experiencing that environment is over not just one moment in time, but over a little more extended period of time. So I'm gonna come back to the 16 degrees Celsius because it has biological importance it obviously can vary. There are individual fish that can survive in warmer waters, um, but they may not uh, be able to persist for um, particularly long periods of time. So there's uh, depends on where you are too. Fish that are adapted to streams in um, California or even the Willamette Valley in Oregon may be uh, more uh, well adapted to somewhat warmer temperatures than that. So this is showing um, a map of, uh, oh, 25, 30 different streams in the east part of Kitsap County that the Suquamish tribe has um, stream temperature data for going back almost 20 years. And what I'm showing with color coded is where the uh, maximum uh, seven day average daily maximum temperature um, what, what those temperatures are in these different streams. You see a lot of variability. You see very cool streams, even during the hottest days of summer, Gorse Creek, Anderson Creek, Johnson Creek, uh, the North Fork of Dogfish in Big Valley. They never really exceed this 12 to 14 degrees Celsius um, range. Whereas on the other end of extremes, you see these red um, streams. A number of those are typically exceeding that 16 degree threshold during the summertime. Um, and you could probably pick out um, a lot of those Curly Creek, Salmonberry, uh, Chico Creek main stem, Clear Creek, at least the lower part of Clear Creek and Silverdale, Scandia, um, a couple of branches of Dogfish Creek. This graph is indicating, um, I think it's eight different temperature site stations all in the Chico Creek watershed in one year over the course of the summer. And a couple of things you might notice is that though there's variability from site to site, some of these are cooler, maybe in the headwater areas. There are a number of um, locations that tend to be warmer. And the other major thing is that I've plotted this with air temperature and you could see that sort of regardless of where you are, they tend to mimic, um, they sort of mirror each other um, through the course of the summer. And that's probably driven mainly by little mini heat waves. As uh, we get series of 80 degree days or more, um, 90 degree days, things kind of heat up throughout the watershed, um, but not, there's sort of a, each location has its own, own sort of baseline. So naturally cooler areas will warm up, but they're not gonna warm up quite as much. This is uh, one station, one temperature station on the Chico Creek main stem over the course of many different years. This goes back a few years now, but um, it's a, I think a really uh, helpful graph to look at because what it shows is from year to year, there's a lot of variability 
Um, this dotted line or dashed line is again indicating the 16 degree threshold. So the Chico main stem, most years it can stay above that threshold um, throughout a good portion, if not most of the summer. This is a graph using again the Suquamish tribes data indicating that pretty strong relationship between air temperature and water temperature. This is plotting air temperature against stream temperature. It's going in that positive direction. Um, so as air temperature uh, goes up, water temperatures go up. And this is, I've combined um, six different uh, stream locations over the course of uh, about 12 or 13 years in showing this. This is showing a very similar um, relationship. Again, um, air and water temperature at one location. Um, at Wildcat Creek. Again, over the course of, I think, 13 years there. And so this, again, brings in the, the question of air temperature is driving a lot of this, but um, what is the role of groundwater? I think we've already talked about that. Um, groundwater seems to help buffer um, increases, buffer against increases in, in warming air temperatures. But, um, I would suggest there are probably limits to how well that buffering of groundwater can, can take place. So this is again work from the Point No Point Treaty Council on some of their uh, modeling of now um, stream temperature changes looking into the future. Again, the blue arrows are these low elevation um, rain dominated systems that typify the Kitsap Peninsula. And you can see as we move from more or less the present day, something like Big Beef Creek, the mean August temperature now, this is maybe 10 years ago now, but is in that 12.35 Celsius range. As we move into the future, toward the end of the century, it's gonna be it's projected to be nearly three degrees warmer than that. And that's, that's mean temperature. That's not even saying anything about the more extremes. So, um, you could see you could you could start to think about what the implications for native fish might be and other uh, biota in our streams. I think I'll skip through this. This is I'm going to show some maps that I think illustrate this point even more. Um, and here's one, actually right here, showing how um, stream temperatures are projected to increase from the current day um, into the future on some of these Olympic Peninsula and Kitsap Peninsula streams. Uh, much hotter colors, these, this is showing temperature increase from the current time. Um, in some of these uh, main stems, I think this is the Dosi Wallops River here, um, parts of the Dungeness River. Much more moderate here in the Kitsap Peninsula. It's more in the order of maybe two to three degrees um, Celsius increase. When you zoom in to a, a stream network, like, this is Tarbu Creek um, right there on the Olympic Peninsula, rain dominated system like um, similar to what we have here in Kitsap. You could see how um, in the current day you have some of these main stems and, and and uh, important tributaries that exceed that seven day um, window of 16 degrees Celsius on the order of maybe 25 to 50 days a year during summer. By uh, the latter quarter of the 21st century, that's now exceeding 75 days. So it gives you some idea of um, how that could change um, how fish would behave in that system. Very quickly, this is looking back, oh, nearly 20 years of data on a number of streams um, in the East Kitsap area. You might recognize some of these streams. I point out 2015, um, a lot of red. So this is showing percentage of summer days that exceed that 16 degree uh, Celsius. And in 2015, more of these streams popped up. Um, and the question that a number of people have asked is whether 2015 is sort of a harbinger 
uh, future conditions. Um, and I think a lot of the data, a lot of the model projections are indicating that is probably the case. Um, so Quamish uh, completed a, a working with a contractor in the summer of 2019. They flew a helicopter and um, took thermal infrared imagery of Tire Chico Creek watershed um, up the main stem and the tributaries. And the whole idea was to try to identify where there were cold water pockets or, or potential refugia during the summertime. Uh, this is a location on Lost Creek, major tributary to Chico Creek during summer. And you have this consolidated, um, more consolidated glacial material with seeps of water draining down into the uh, into Lost Creek here. And sure enough, there were juvenile, um, what looked like juvenile coho that were um, kind of nosing right up into these um, cooler uh, water seeps coming in. This is a temperature profile showing as you go from upstream toward the mouth of Chico Creek. And um, this is that, that thermal infrared work that was done. You can see where the temperature is kind of rising as you go downstream and then where you get a tributary input like Dickerson Creek or maybe some little hyperreic areas or um, small groundwater seeps coming in, things cool off and then uh, they may warm up again like a tributary where Kitsap Creek enters is, is a particularly warm one. Um, so I could talk more about this but um, and, and we could talk about this for a long time, but how do climate change and human land use intersect? Um, as we clear native forests, we harden surfaces, we um, channelize our, our streams and our floodplains, we simplify the habitats. Um, those tend to increase our high flows and decrease our low flows. Um, and they tend to warm our summer temperatures. Um, you know, removal of riparian vegetation and things like that. So um, climate change is likely to amplify those human land use changes that are already taking place on the landscape and have been for, uh, for many decades now and, and um, will into the future. And so this is just a cartoon showing how um, climate change and land use sort of um, intersect in this amplification effect um, in a rain dominated system like here in Kitsap is future climate change is sort of a more moderate increase in, in high flows and a more moderate decrease in low flows. But when you um, add on uh, changes to the landscape, uh, removal of essentially removal of forests and increasing hard surfaces um, that just ramps up in the wintertime and tends to ramp down more in the summertime. This is a sort of a logic model explaining um, how climate change alters watersheds and what the implications for salmon. And we've talked about this, but higher stream temperatures and low flows um, can delay or block uh, the movement of fish in a watershed, can increase their susceptibility to diseases. Um, the timing of biological events uh, called phenology, a term you might be familiar with. So when, uh, salmon fry emerge from the gravel in say uh, late winter, early spring, um, or maybe even early parts of summer for something like a steelhead, uh, what's available in terms of food for them? Or has that uh, food source been, um, the timing of that food source been altered somewhat because of changes in flow or, or changes in um, temperature? There's also the question of how uh, non-native species like bass we know we're in parts of Chico Creek. Um, will those uh, non-native fish expand and how does that affect predator-prey interactions? Um, and then there's this issue, I haven't talked too much about the effect of winter, increased winter floods um, on salmon, but the real issue of increasing the scouring of their nests or their reds the sedimentation, increased sedimentation with those floods and what that means for their habitat and ultimately a potential for reducing their survival. So we wanna look at how salmon use the watersheds over the course of a year um, or their entire life stages, um, where they are in the watersheds 
and what the particular stressors are during that time. This would represent sort of that potential scouring of salmon reds during winter floods, whereas this is the summer warmest and driest period. Um, species like coho and steelhead and cutthroat are residing in our streams during that uh, warmest, driest period. So I'm going to move ahead somewhat. Here's a cartoon showing current conditions during that summer dry time, just sort of conceptually showing in green what are suitable habitats during the current conditions, but what might the future hold as things dry up and warm up? Um, do we fragment areas where fish are, are um, sort of confined to certain areas? They can't migrate through particularly warm or dry stretches of stream. Monitoring, I can't emphasize enough. There's a lot we do not know. Um, in particular, how um, stream temperatures and flows are affecting salmon in our local watersheds right now. There's some work beginning on that, but um, uh, there's a lot more, lot more work to, um, and I should say with these uh, climate models and the work that Point No Point Treaty Council's done, the University of Washington, um, Suquamish is also working with the University of Washington right now in some modeling. Those things are not, um, we have the information that, that we know about right now, but um, our expectations that as we learn more, we're able to improve those models and, and uh, improve the certainty in those models as we move forward. Um, I think why don't we leave it with this. This is the final po um, poll question, which I think really gets down to um, what can we do incre to increase the resilience of our watersheds and, and salmon to climate change? Well, I think I'll just finish the last uh, minute or two here. Um, I, I, it, I guess it's good to see that nobody took the bait there and, and went for the trapping and getting the beavers out. Um, we did a lot of that and we still do some of that. So there are a lot of uh, really genuine efforts right now going on to try to protect beavers in our watersheds and um, allow them to um, do the things that they do that benefit um, the watersheds where, where it's appropriate, where we can. Um, so um, to answer the question, I think you the group here was pretty sharp. There is some guidance out there um, that was recently done by folks in our region that looked at how do we re restore salmon habitat for a changing climate. And they hit on these very things. The kind of the overriding question is how do we address watershed processes holistically and um, sort of driven by two basic questions. What helps keep waters cool during the summer? Because that is a, is a big stressor point in terms of uh, climate change and what would protect and restore natural flow regimes. And so we just um, hit on some of these. Uh, protecting or restoring habitat connectivity, not just up and down the watersheds by um, fixing culverts or removing dams and things like that, but laterally um, making sure our floodplains um, are well connected and uh, what that does is it promotes uh, greater complexity of habitats for fish to use um, during different uh, times of the year. Both winter time, those floodplains are, can be uh, uh, refugia as well as during summer. Protecting our riparian corridors, um, in particular the vegetation, um, promoting habitat complexity. And then the big one is beavers. And beavers really in terms of how they function I think some of you probably know they help to store water, sort of moderate those winter floods and um, hold that water back so that it's available during the summer low flow periods. And they um, promote um, greater habitat complexity. Beaver ponds have been shown to be highly productive for a lot of those summer rearing salmonids, um, particularly coho, cutthroat, maybe steelhead as well. <clears throat> the last thing I think I'll, I'll show is that our watersheds here in Kitsap and the salmon are both vulnerable and resilient to climate change. Their vulnerabilities are, are they're all low elevation. So they're subject to these higher uh, temperatures already. They're small. The salmon populations tend to be small. So they're, they're vulnerable to um, stresses. 
we have naturally uh, very low summer flows that could only be exacerbated, uh, could be exacerbated with climate change. And we do have a lot of land use development pressures. The resilience points here are that they are low elevation, so we don't have any snow to lose, unlike other parts of Puget Sound. Um, we've sort of spread our eggs into many different baskets. We have many different independent watersheds as opposed to sort of the Skagit. Um, and with that, we have um, a fair amount of salmon population diversity. We have groundwater, and I would say beavers as sort of our allies um, against um, changes in climate change. And we still have a lot of well-forested um, parts of our watersheds to, that we should work hard to protect. I think I'll leave it at that, thanks. Uh, Kathy Peters is our second speaker today. She's from Kitsap County's Department of Community Development in the Planning and Environmental Programs Division. I just wanted to um, say a couple of things. First of all, I'm a fisheries biologist. I graduated from the University of Washington, go dogs in uh, 1978. And at that time, we didn't really talk in fishery science about habitat. So um, we didn't know that we were gonna screw things up as badly as we did with their small habitats, uh, watersheds in particular. But I wanted to say one really positive thing, which is that um, you may have known, heard that the ferries were, were altered their routes yesterday because there were orcas out feeding in between basically in the central sound and they were feeding on our wild fish and a lot of the wild chum that come into the south sound and something when steve's talking about all of the pressures on the wild salmonids in our watersheds to remind you about is that we um we have all wild fish so they're very little sub hatchery supplementation i'm just going to run through a presentation that i put together and a lot of the slides come from tom ostrom who's a fisheries biologist or environmental scientist at the squamish tribe and so his credit comes through, but um, I'm gonna talk about Chico, um, which is really one of our, our most important watersheds. But before I do that, I have to give a pitch for Sure Friendly Kitsap, which is um, a voluntary program for removing bulkheads in um, Kitsap County. So if you live in anywhere in Kitsap, including in an incorporated city, please contact us at Shore Friendly Kitsap. And I will say that salmon need healthy near shore too. Uh, and that's do a lot of other species. So I just wanted to give that pitch. Uh-oh. Oh, okay, this is the Chico watershed. So we were standing on top of the bridge and we got this drone um, flyer to come in and, and that's the culvert under the bridge at Chico getting chipped away. That's us up on the bridge. <laughs> so this was a 33 foot long culvert that the Navy built to transport trains. And it was cutting off access to Chico Salmon Park. We built the bridge in 2019 and they tore this culvert out in 2020. So the creek is dry right now. It's it's put in five pipes to divert past all of this restoration area. And this is at the estuary. And those cars that you see in the background are Highway 3 crossing the bridge, crossing the creek. I just wanted to show you that in case we got interrupted or I couldn't talk or something. 
Anyway, I'm going to go through these slides quickly um, because um, I think you guys know where Chico is. Um, and then just kind of an overview of the projects that have gone on in the Chico watershed, the, the estuary restoration, removing a road, uh, county road called Kitty Hawk Drive, and um, we had to put in a new road for residents on the other edge of the creek. We've done significant restoration with, in partnership with the Kitsap Golf and Country Club to restore the floodplain. Um, and that was considered temporary until we got this bridge that you just saw the video of fixed. And that was the Golf Club Hill Bridge where we replaced the culvert with the bridge and, and we're still working on protecting the floodplain. And then Highway 3 um, construction is going to be a major um, impact on our community because they're gonna remove the culverts, build bridges, off ramps, et cetera. Okay, first I wanted to show you that this Chico restoration and, and watershed planning has been going on, you see on the bottom of this, 2004, and the community got together in a re re really major effort um, and planned this together. And we've been ticking off the projects ever since. Uh, this is an aerial view of the mouth of the Chico estuary. Can you see my cursor? Anyway. Yeah. Okay, so Chico comes, this is cut off estuary up here in the park. When the, when the, um, when the, this route was put in, it basically cut the, the, the estuary and the creek off and it went through uh, two culverts. The new, um, the new creek channel is right over here now. The aerial of the Chico watershed. Uh, this is just an, um, ex, uh, an old but um, somewhat impressive slide that shows you how many fish um, return to the Chico watershed. And again, these are completely natural populations. So, um, and I'm pointing out here in 1997, the orca whales um, stayed in Dye's Inlet for about a month and fed. Um, as Steve said earlier, um, and we've had, uh, tribal folks here for a long, long time. And um, they, many of them lived out at, at or out of the Chico area. This is just some um, snapshot of, this is a bit dated too, but how much um, private and protected land we have in the watershed, which is really important. Um, this is just a, a very graphic, all these slides are counts, counting pieces of wood, but this just shows you what a wood with no stream, a natural stream with no wood and a natural stream with wood looks like. And those are the numbers. Uh, this is um, altered um, floodplain basically on the next upstream portion of Chico Creek and um, some of the transportation problems we've had because of the high velocity. Um, this is just pointing out some of the other restoration that's gone on in Dyes Inlet. Dyes Inlet is a very important, uh, not just for Chico, but for these other watersheds. Barker Creek had a, um, a culvert replaced on, on Tracy Dean Boulevard about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, Buckland Hill Road, uh, they replaced these culverts at Clear Creek. And um, that's these are all estuary projects. and. Um, we also did a, a, some very significant estuary projects up north in Carpenter Creek where, with South and West Kingston Roads. Okay, this is what's called a T-sheet, which was um, the 19 or 1881 um, uh, estimate of what the shoreline looked like. All these little dots are trees. So here's Highway 3, and he's, um, this shoreline was, was marked as going all the way up here. That's hard shoreline, and then this is associated with it a, a, as an estuary. And then um, this is a planning map for Highway 3 showing the, the wide divergence of creek, the creek at the mouth, what was basically put into these little um, culverts. And that's the just a graphic of, of the fill from Highway 3, which you'll see come out, oops, um, in the next few years. And this was the Kitty Cock fill that Feel that came out in the early, um, like in 2014 when we did that project. Again, it's just some um, historical photos of Chico, um, you know, and, and how it used to flow and, and how it can flow. Um, this is 
actually uh, Kitty Hawk before it came out at a major flow, it actually washed off part of the um, bridge at the, excuse me, part of the road at the outfall. That's all gone now. And that's another shot of the Kitty Hawk Road before we took it out. For those of you who are familiar with the estuary, that's what it used to look like. Um, I'll try to go through these. Uh, this is just giving you some idea of the complex nature of this. It, we, you can't just say, I'm going to remove this road. This was the road we removed right here. We had to buy this property. This is um, was also um, a conservation easement placed on this. This property was acquired. This property was an easement put on it. We had to uh, move utilities. Uh, as I said, we had to construct a new driveway, which comes down here, service these houses right here, um, et cetera. Again, this is the, the old, uh, that's, that's actually Highway 3 culvert. And that's the Highway 3 culvert. And now we're talking about what they're going to have to do to retrofit that, or if they would retrofit it. Now they're going to build a bridge. I'll go through these quickly. So um, this is when the estuary project was just completed and what the new channel looked like. The old channel was over here. You can still see it if you go down there and um, see the fishermen and look off to the north. These are Tom's lesson learned associated with that estuary project. And I think they're pretty meaningful in, in the partnership department. Um, in particular, um, all of these projects take a, a tremendous amount of working together with unbelievable numbers of people. And, um, and, and kudos to the tribe for doing this. This project was funded by the Navy, EPA, um, the state of Washington, the tribe, and Kitsap County. And uh, citizens that um, gave their property for less than it was, sold their property for less than it was worth. Oh, here's all our, who, who contributed. And a list of the partners um, at the Chico Creek um, project. Again, as I said in the last project, we have to have a lot of partners. Chico had four um, property owners. That's the golf course. Um, the golf course had been channelized. This is, a, um, this is a map of the planned design before we did the work. That is the triple box culvert that I showed you the the video coming out. And that is looking down at the creek before we did the restoration at the golf course. The creek was channelized into these little pillow bag uh, concrete walls. And that's a look at the what it looked like before it was completely full of invasives as well. That's um, that is, uh, you know, the really bad plant right there. <laughs> this is a flood it, at Chico. Uh, I believe this is 2003 or four. One of those bridges washed out. And these are just a typical flood. I think this might have been 2007 at, um, at the golf course. Um, this is chum piling up below one of the uh, grade controls at the golf course, um, which um, was, we're failing over and over again, which is why we're still working on this project. Chum can't get, can't, chum can't jump. They can swim really well, but they can't jump. This is more design of the golf course rid. I'm going to go through. This is, this is the construction at the golf club. We did it in two phases um, in like 2007 and finished in about 2012. One of the interesting things that Kitsap Golf and Country Club donated much of the wood that we used in the stream. They just cut down some of the trees on the club and stored it for us. Um, these engineered projects have quite a bit of hidden wood uh, as, as in addition to the wood that you see that sticks out of the ground. And that is to direct the flow in an engine. That's, that's why they're called engineered. They're actually engineering the foul wag, which was the main uh, part of the stream. Again, just some shots of the engineering of these habitat structures going in. Um, it's quite costly and somewhat um, theoretical that this will work. And this is the restoration just after it was completed. It's quite a bit of uh, growth there now. 
And now this is um, was forward looking when I gave this project. We hadn't finished the bridge yet, but um, we've been working for this on this project for 15 years, the Golf Club Hill Bridge. <laughs> um, and then Highway 3. Um, uh, is a fully funded design build project. It's going to have an estimated hydraulic opening of about 200 feet and a bridge length of 400 feet. Um, the time is starting right now, actually, uh, but they're gonna start construction where you'll see them out doing things in 2021. Um, we're gonna start on the Chico Way uh, south side of, of the highway and working on restoring a little trip there and putting a bridge on Chico Way and moving those off ramps. This is just another old um, tea sheet. And this, uh, you can look these up if you're, if you're interested in it. Steve, you know the, the formal name of this better than I, but it's um, a University of Washington project where they digitized all of these, um, these hand-drawn um, surveys. Yeah, if you, uh, I could put it on the chat. Because it's really cool to look up where you lived, and this little this this shows what they what they look like, and then you just zoom in, and you can download the data. Okay, I'm done. So we can have lots of questions. I remember a study about a decade ago where that hatcheries were raising fry to an older stage before releasing to increase the survival percentage. Does that work or is it species dependent? So each of the species has a different life history and um, the state of Washington was specifically growing Chinook to yearling because they, they, they stay in Puget Sound and become what are called blackmouth and, and, and they're a target for sport fishermen. Um, there are Chinook, which are the ESA listed fish in Puget Sound and steelhead, which are the other ESA listed species, have tremendously diverse habitat or life histories. So you can't really say Chinook stay in freshwater for nine months because some of them um, emerge from the gravel and go to sea fairly quickly. And they they came in another, um, they evolved in a watershed where or maybe there isn't a lot of freshwater rearing and some stay in freshwater uh, steelhead up to three years. So um, manipulating their life history is a classic um, hatchery tool. And when they stagger or, or allow fish to volitionally go at their own will, that's when they're trying to mimic their natural life history. I understand wood is good in creeks, streams for habitat area, but can there be too much wood debris or can the salmon somehow get through? You want to answer that, Steve? They get through. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I was looking for the mute button. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, would, I wouldn't worry too much about too much wood. Um, I have the opposite concern. And um, mm -hmm. Kathy showed, I, I think, a good paired photo there on Chico Creek where I think I call it the bowling alley. There's just, uh, call it a plain bed situation. There's just really little, very little wood and very little complexity um, compared to sort of stacked wood and what we call wood jams. And the fish, um, the fish find a way, even the chum tend to uh, work their way through. And uh, the benefits, I think far, uh, outpace the any um, you know potential delays and things like that that might happen in their movements. Um, I had somebody email in worried about the salmon getting over the beaver dam. Did one of you want to answer that? Where is this? It's over by Salmon Haven. So I, I believe the, the stream levels aren't quite where they need to be. And so the salmon are pulling, pulling up right before the dam. Oh, it's on Chico, just upstream of Dickerson. Yes. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. 
first of all, there's people that are walking the streams that are paying attention that are tribal and other biologists. And, um, you know, if there's a problem, you can move a couple sticks, they would do that, but I wouldn't worry. All right. Really. So, so what would you say to someone who was worried about it? Wait until fish... it rains. <laughs> What'd you say? Well, I, usually yeah. what we, it's a pretty uh, yeah. common pattern is, um, you know, right now we're in this kind of um, period of, it's been pretty dry. Um, mm -hmm. I've been up in a couple of streams just in the past few days and um, it was surprisingly dry to me. The flows are still pretty low, but it looks like the forecast is for days and days of, of rain, which is favorable for, for uh, fish moving up um, both coho and chum. And um, it also tends to uh, blow out certain parts of these dams or the channel will, um, I'm trying to animate, you can't see me, but um, the, you know, the channel will work its way around um, yeah. and uh, either over or even under. I mean, I've seen so many fish going through wood jams or beaver dams where they're able to uh, work their way actually under some of that material, um, so. And also they move at night. I, I, you, I challenged that person to go back the next day and see how many fish were in that pool. Cause they just, they, they see them during the day and they, they, you know, the fish aren't moving. I used to live on a hatchery and stand there and watch this fish in the creek all the time. Okay, one more beaver question. Beavers are a pretty hot topic, so. <laughs> How can beavers be allowed to remain? Martha John Creek in North Kitsap is continuing to have them removed and they later return. We're actually working on things with a, and all of the watersheds in Raya 15, which is all our peninsula, including Vashon. And um, we're working on looking at some kind of beaver management plan so that we could compensate and let let property owners just leave their land alone basically identify where there would be beaver habitat potentially and have people voluntarily say i i'll let that piece that my my area flood even though you wouldn't necessarily be you know predictably getting beavers but there's a lot a lot of work going into this if you're interested in it um i would uh, also, Kitsap, I would contact Dave Ward from Kitsap County. There's some studies about what would motivate people to do this on their land. Because really, it's, it's impacting private property owners for the most part. Kathy can take that one. She watches fish all the time. What is it? What's the question? About salmon jumping or not jumping. Uh, oh. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Salmon can, so summer steelhead can jump really far. Like you look at a 10 foot and people don't believe they jump that far. That's the one that I, I, I know of that jumps the farthest, like really far. Um, chum, I don't know why, but they can't jump. They just weren't, they, they're lowland spawners. They, they just didn't go, they didn't make it up into the upper stream. Coho jumped pretty well. Um, and pinks, not so much. <laughs> Pinks are low and like spawn in the estuary almost. So um, it, it depends on what those species, where they spawned, where they have to go to get you know back. Um, I have a I have a thought on that too, if I can add is, um, and I don't know if there's data to back this up or not, but I've talked to a few other people about this and I think Chum, in more modern times in our little watersheds, chum probably outnumber coho generally. Um, certainly in, in like Chico Creek, it's really abundant chum run. And one thought is that before they were beaver trapped and removed and before um, our forests were um, harvested, particularly in the riparian areas and before the wood was removed, um, is that coho may have been um, far more plentiful, certainly more plentiful than they are today in a lot of our watersheds, um, and possibly more plentiful than the than the chum. 
And uh, again, I don't have data to really back that up. It's sort of a hypothesis, but the, the reasoning was that, that I think about is that our streams were, um, tend to be far more complex just in the kinds of habitats that were available um, off channel, you know, floodplains. Um, a lot of the kind of agricultural areas, um, a few areas in Kitsap we see now that have been really channelized, those very well could have just been full of beaver ponds and, and uh, braided channels and, and, and things like that, that would have been uh, really productive for uh, coho and um, probably steelhead and, and uh, cutthroat and things like that. And probably not quite as productive for, um, for chum. And chum may have just not been able to access some of those habitats long ago. The other thing that I'd like to say that is one of my pet peeves is, is or not pet peeves, but our peninsula is, it looks like, you know, when you draw a map, the, the creeks go like this, you know, down there. Well, at the top are beaver ponds. And some creeks, if the beaver ponds this way, the creek would go to a canal or it would go the other way. And I know that Gamble and Dogfish Creek are an example of that, where there's been a beaver pond in place and it's it's pushed the water one way or the other, but m most of our headwaters probably were very, very complex um, habitat that um, increased the groundwater. I mean, there was a whole bunch of reasons to protect that headwater. And for salmon habitat restoration, we don't really talk about that, but it's so, so important to protect those wetlands, these, these swampy areas that we look at for beaver for so many other reasons than just fish and beavers. Um, but it, it, the historic, what it looked like here and how our fish moved through, I mean, like Steve says, it could have been completely different. They probably utilized whatever part of the habitat, you know, which species ended up in, you know, the coolest was probably, and the highest up was probably steelhead because they need that. A lot. I mean, it's just, who knows? Thank you.